at fourth grade. Um, we're going to be reading another two chapters of Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Um, so Brian had a really exciting discovery in the last two chapters we read when he was able to um, finally make fire. He definitely had a lot of trial and error, right? He kept trying and trying and trying, but he showed that determination and he stuck with it and he was able to be successful. Um, so he, um, so that's something to definitely carry over and to take away from um, Brian and all of the struggles he's having that um, with determination and that perseverance, um, sometimes success, you will see success. And, and for Brian, he was able to see success. So now that he has fire, let's see how this newfound um, success carries over for him. Chapter 10. He could not at first leave the fire. It was so precious to him, so close and sweet a thing, the yellow and red flames brightening the dark interior of the shelter, the happy crackle of the dry wood as it burned, that he could not leave it. He went to the trees and brought in as many dead limbs as he could chop off and carry. And when he had a large pile of them, he sat near the fire. Though it was getting into the warm middle part of the day and he was hot and broke them into small pieces and fed the fire. I will not let you go out, he said to himself, to the flames, not ever. And so he sat through a long part of the day, keeping the flames even, eating from his stock of raspberries, leaving to drink from the lake when he was thirsty. In the afternoon, toward the evening, with his face smoke smeared and his skin red from the heat, he finally began to think ahead to what he needed to do. So now he's planning ahead. He would need a large wood pile to get through the night. It would be almost impossible to find wood in the dark, so he had to have it all in and cut and stacked before the sun went down. Brian made certain the fire was banked with new wood, then went out of the shelter and searched for a good fuel supply. Up the hill from the campsite, the same windstorm that left him to play left him a place to land the plane, had that only been three or four days ago, had dropped three large white pines across each other. They were dead now, dry and filled with weather, dry, dead limbs, enough for many days. He chopped and broke and carried wood back to the camp, stacking the pieces under the overhang until he had what he thought to be an enormous pile, as high as his head and six feet across the base. Between trips, he added small pieces to the fire to keep it going, and on one of the trips to get wood, he noticed an added advantage of the fire. When he was in the shade of the trees, breaking limbs, the mosquitoes swarmed on him as usual. But when he came to the fire or just near the shelter where the smoke eddied and swirled, the insects were gone. It was a wonderful discovery. So he had a little aha moment, right? Discovery would be an aha moment that the, that the smoke from the fire is helping to keep the mosquitoes away. The mosquitoes had nearly driven him mad and the thought of being rid of them lifted his spirits. On another trip, he looked back and saw the smoke curling up through the trees and realized for the first time that he now had the means to make a signal. He could carry a burning stick and build a signal and perhaps attract attention. So again, he realized, there's one of those, another one of those words, he had another aha moment, which meant more wood and still more wood. There did not seem to be an end to the wood that he would need and he spent all the rest of the afternoon into dusk making wood trips. At dark, he settled in again for the night next to the fire with the stack of short pieces ready to put on and he ate the rest of the raspberries. During all the work of the day, his leg had loosened, but it still ached a bit, and he rubbed it and watched the fire and thought for the first time since the crash that he might be getting a handle on things. He might be starting to do something other than just sit. He was out of food, but he could look tomorrow, and he could build a signal fire tomorrow and get more wood tomorrow. The fire cut the night coolness and settled him back into sleep, thinking of tomorrow. He slept hard and wasn't sure what awakened him, but his eyes came open and he stared into the darkness. The fire had burned down and looked out, but he stirred it with a piece of wood and found there were a bed of coals still glowing hot and red. With small pieces of wood and carefully blowing, he soon had a blaze going again. That had been close. He had to be sure to try to sleep in short intervals so that he could keep the fire going, and he tried to think of a way to regulate his sleep, but it made him sleepy to think about it and he was just going under again when he heard the sound outside. It was not unlike the sound of the porcupine, something slithering and being dragged across the sand, but when he looked out the door opening, it was too dark to see anything. Whatever it was stopped making the sound in a few moments, and he thought he heard something sloshing into the water at the shoreline. 
but he had the fire now and plenty of wood, so he wasn't worried as he had been the night before. He dozed, slept for a time, awakened again just at dawn gray light and added wood to the still smoking fire before standing outside and stretching. Standing with his arms stretched over his head and the tight knot of hunger in his stomach, he looked toward the lake and saw the tracks. They were strange, a main center line up from the lake in the sand with claw marks to the side leading to a small pile of sand, then going back down to the water. He walked over and squatted near them, studied them, tried to make sense of them. Whatever had made the tracks had some kind of flat, dragging bottom in the middle and was apparently pushed along by the legs that stuck out to the side. Up from the water to a small pile of sand, then back down into the water. Some animal, some kind of water animal that comes up to the sand to, to do what? To do something with the sand, to play and make a pile in the sand? He smiled. City boy, he thought. Oh, you city boy with your city ways. He made a mirror in his mind, a mirror of himself, and saw how he must look. City boy with your city ways, sitting in the sand, trying to read the tracks and not knowing, not understanding. Why would anything wild come up from the water to play in the sand? Not that way. Animals weren't that way. They didn't waste time that way. It had come up from the water for a reason, a good reason, and he must try to understand the reason. He must change to fully understand the reason himself, or he would not make it. It had come up from the water for a reason, and the reason he thought, squatting, the reason had to do with the pile of sand. He brushed the top off gently with his hand, but found only damp sand. Still, there must be a reason, and he carefully kept scraping and digging until about four inches down, he suddenly came into a small chamber in the cool, damp sand, and there lay eggs, many eggs, almost perfectly round eggs the size of table tennis balls, and he laughed then because he knew it had been a turtle. He had seen a show on television about sea turtles that came up onto beaches and laid their eggs in the sand. There must be freshwater lake turtles that did the same thing. Maybe snapping turtles. He had heard of snapping turtles. They became fairly large, he thought. It must have been a snapper that came up in the night when he heard that noise that awakened him. She must have come and then laid her eggs. Food! More than eggs, more than knowledge, more than anything. This was food. His stomach tightened and rolled and made noise as he looked at the eggs, as if his stomach belonged to somebody else or had seen the eggs with his own eyes and was demanding food. The hunger, always there, had been somewhat controlled and dormant when there was nothing to eat. But with the eggs came the scream to eat. His whole body craved food with such an intensity that it quickened his breath. He reached into the nest and pulled the eggs out one at a time. There were 17 of them, each as round as a ball and white. They had leathery shells that gave instead of breaking when he squeezed them. When he had them heaped on the sand in a pyramid, he had never felt so rich somehow. He suddenly realized that he did not know how to eat them. He had a fire but no way to cook them, no container, and he had never thought of eating a raw egg. He had an uncle named Carter, his father's brother, who always put an egg in a glass of milk and drank it in the morning. Brian had watched him do it once, just once, and when the runny part of the white left the glass and went into his uncle's mouth and down the throat in a single gulp, Brian almost lost everything that he had just eaten. Still, he thought, still. As his stomach moved towards his backbone, he became less and less fussy. Sometimes natives in the world ate grasshoppers and ants if they could do that. Then he could get a raw egg down. He picked one up and tried to break the shell and found it surprisingly tough. Finally, using the hatchet, he sharpened a stick and poked a hole into the egg. He widened the hole with his finger and looked inside. Just an egg. It had a dark yellow yolk and not much white as he thought there would be. Just an egg. Food. Just an egg he had to eat. Raw. <laughs> He looked out across the lake and brought the egg to his mouth and closed his eyes and sucked and squeezed in the egg at the same time and swallowed as fast as he could. Ugh. It had a greasy, almost oily taste, but it was still an egg. His throat tried to throw it back up. His whole body seemed to convulse with it, but his stomach took it, held it, and demanded more. The second egg was easier, and by the third one, he had no trouble at all. It just slid right down. He ate six of them. He could have easily eaten all of them and not been full, 
but the part of him that said to hold back and save the rest won. He could not now believe the hunger. The eggs had awakened it fully, roaringly, so that it tore at him. After the sixth egg, he ripped the shell open and licked the inside clean. And then he went back and ripped the other five open and licked them out as well and wondered if he could eat the shells. There must be some food value in them. But when he tried, there were too leathery to chew and he couldn't get them down. He stood away from the eggs for a moment, literally stood and turned away so that he could not see them. If he looked at them, he would have to eat more. He would store them in the shelter and eat only one a day. He fought the hunger down, controlled it. He would take them now and store them and save them and eat one a day. And he realized as he thought it that he had forgotten that they might come. The searchers, surely they would come before he could eat all of the eggs at one a day. He had forgotten to think about them and that wasn't good. He had to keep thinking of them because if he forgot about them and did not think of them, they might forget about him. And he had to keep hoping. He had to keep hoping. Chapter 11. There were these things to do. He transferred all the eggs from the small beach into the shelter, reburying them near his sleeping area. It took all of his will to keep from eating another one as he moved them, but he got it done, and when they were out of sight again, it was easier. He added wood to the fire and cleaned up the camp area. A good laugh, that cleaning up the camp. All he did was shake out his windbreaker and hang it in the sun to dry, the berry juice that had soaked it, and smooth the sand where he slept. But it was a mental thing. He had gotten depressed thinking about how they hadn't found him yet. And when he was busy and had something to do, then the depression seemed to leave. So there were things to do. With the camp squared away, he brought in more wood. He had decided to always have enough on hand for three days. And after spending one night with the fire for a friend, with the fire for a friend, so he's pretending the friend, his fire is a friend, he knew what a staggering amount of wood it would take. He worked all through the morning at the wood, breaking down dead limbs and breaking or chopping them into smaller pieces, storing them neatly beneath the, no the overhang. He stopped once to take a drink at the lake, and in his reflection, he saw that the swelling on his head was nearly gone. There was no pain there, so he assumed that had taken care of itself. His leg was also back to normal, although he had a small pattern, he had a small pattern of holes, roughly star-shaped, where the quills had nailed him. And while he was standing at the lake shore taking stock, he noticed that his body was changing. He had never been fat, but he had been slightly heavy with a little extra weight just above his belt at his sides. This was completely gone. And his stomach had like caved in to the hunger and the sun had cooked him past burning. So he was tanning and with the smoke from the fire, his face was starting to look like leather. But perhaps more than his body was the change in his mind or in the way he was becoming. It's a contrast and contradiction. I am not the same, I thought. I see, I hear differently. He did not know when the change started, but it was there. When a sound came to him now, he didn't just hear it, but he would know the sound. He would swing and look at it, a breaking twig, a movement of air, and know the sound as if somehow could move his mind back down to the wave of sound to the source. He could know what the sound was before he quite realized he had heard it. And when he saw something, a bird moving a wing inside a bush or a ripple on the water, he would truly see that thing. Not just notice it as he used to notice things in the city. He would see all parts of it. He would see the whole wing, the feathers, the color of the feathers, the bush, the size and shape and the color of the leaves. He would see the way the light moved with the ripples on the water and see that the wind made the ripples and which way that wind had to blow to make the ripples move in a certain way. None of that used to be in Brian, and now it was part of him, a changed part of him, a grown part of him. And the two things, his mind and his body had come together as well, had made a connection with each other that he didn't quite understand. When his ears heard a sound or his eyes saw a sight, his mind took control of his body. Without his thinking, he moved to face the sound or sight, moved to make ready for it, to deal with it. So it's almost like he's becoming one with nature, right? He's definitely becoming more in tune with all the things that are around him and he needs to for his survival because that's all that's all he has um it coming in at him is what is surrounding him so he's he's becoming basically one with nature right now there were these things to do when the wood was done he decided to get a signal fire ready he moved to the top of the rock ridge that comprised the bluff over his shelter and was pleased to find a large flat stone area more wood he thought moaning inwardly 
He went back to the fallen trees and found more dead limbs carrying them up on the rock until he had enough for a bonfire. Initially, it thought of making a signal fire every day, but he couldn't. He would never be able to keep the wood supply going. So while he was working, he decided to have the fire ready. And if he heard an engine or even thought he heard a plane engine, he would run up with a burning limb and set off the signal fire. Things to do. At the last trip to the top of the stone bluff with wood, he stopped, sat on the point overlooking the lake, and rested. The lake lay before him 20 or so feet below, and he had not seen it this way since he had come in with the plane. Remembering the crash, he had a moment of fear, a breath tingling, little rip of terror, but it passed, and he was quickly caught up with the beauty of the scenery. It was so incredibly beautiful that it was almost unreal. From his height, he could see not just the lake, but across part of the forest, a green carpet, and it was so full of life birds, insects. There was a constant hum and song. At the other end of the bottom of the L, there was another large rock sticking out over the water, and on top of the rock, a snaggly pine had somehow found food and grown, bent and gnarled. Sitting on one limb was a bluebird with a crest and sharp beak, a kingfisher. He thought of a picture he had seen once, which left the branch while he watched and dove into the water. It emerged a split it emerged a split part of a second later, and in its mouth was a small fish, wiggling silver in the sun. It took the fish to a limb, juggled it twice, and swallowed it whole. Fish. Of course, he thought. There were fish in the lake, and they were food. And if a bird could do it. He scrambled down to the side of the bluff and trotted to the edge of the lake, looking down into the water. Somehow it had never occurred to him to look inside the water, only at the surface. The sun was flashing back up into his eyes, and he moved off to the side and took his shoes off and waded out 15 feet. Then he turned and stood still, with the sun at his back, and studied the water again. It was, as he saw after a moment, literally packed with life. Small fish swam everywhere, some narrow and long, some round, most of them three or four inches long, some a bit larger, and many smaller. There was a patch of mud off to the side, leaping into deeper water, and he could see old clam shells there, so there must be clams. As he watched a crayfish looking like a tiny lobster left one of the empty clam shells and went to another one, looking for something to eat, digging with its claws. While he stood, some of the small roundish fish came quite close to his legs, and he tensed, got ready, and made a wild stab at grabbing one of them. They exploded away in a hundred flicks of quick light, so fast that he had no hope of catching them that way but they soon came back. They seemed to be curious about him, and as he walked from the water, he tried to think of a way to use that curiosity to catch them. He had no books, no hooks or strings, but if he could somehow lure them into the shallows and make a spear, a small fish spear, he might be able to strike fast enough to get one. He would have to find the right kind of wood, slim and straight. He had seen some willows up along the lake that might work, and he could use the hatchet to sharpen it and shape it while he was sitting by the fire tonight and that brought up the fire, which he had to feed again. He looked at the sun and saw that it was getting late in the afternoon, and when he thought of how late it was, he thought that he ought to reward all his hard work with another egg, and that made him think that some kind of dessert would be nice, and he smiled when he thought of dessert so fancy, and he wondered if he should move up the lake and see if he could find some raspberries after he banked the fire, and while he was looking for the right wood for a spear. Spear wood, he thought, and it all rolled together, just rolled together and rolled over him. There were these things to do. So I'm going to stop there. We'll continue on again tomorrow. I'm hoping that you're paying attention to any tough questions Brian is having, any aha moments he's having, and any contrast and contradictions. How is he changing um, as our story is going along? I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.